Good morning, and welcome to Bonacqua and Nunley United Methodist Church's Sunday morning worship. Uh, this is a little bit different this morning. I'm coming to you live from my home office because when I started to come to the church this morning, the roads were so that there were two wrecks uh, within about a mile and a half, so the police officer suggested that I turn around and go home, which I did. Um, I hope that you all got the message, and I hope that uh, you are safe and that you are warm and uh, uh, that you will enjoy our service this morning. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we get started. Um, we were to have a council meeting today. Obviously, that will be canceled. We will have our Ash Wednesday service this coming Wednesday, uh, weather permitting starting at 6 o'clock at Von Aqua, where we will do a, a brief worship and then we'll do an imposition of ashes and celebrate Holy Communion. Uh, then on Monday the 22nd at 10, uh, 10.30 at Von Aqua, we'll begin our Lent Bible study. Uh, that will be on Mondays at Von Aqua at 10.30 and then on Wednesdays at Nunley at 6 o'clock. So Monday the 22nd and Wednesday the 24th we will have our uh, our Lenten Bible studies. I want to remind you that Grace Challenge for March will be on March the 3rd at 6 o'clock and it will be at Nunley in March. Uh, a couple other quick announcements that I wanted to make sure that you got are uh, make sure that you look at the Spring Hill United Methodist Facebook page um, and if you get there um, Sorry, I had to get back on my on my computer. Uh, if you get their newsletter, they are hosting a Financial Peace University. Uh, this is a Dave Ramsey program that uh, that will help us as we try to uh, make sure that our home budgets are in line and that uh, we have control of our money and it doesn't have control of us. Uh, if you need more information on that, you can contact either Janetta or myself, and uh, I will be sending out an email with a link to their webpage and to their newsletter here later today. Uh, a quick thank you to, uh, to Rick Albee. Rick had gone by the church this morning and put out roses for the ladies. Uh, I just want to let you know that those are in the narthex in the entryway if you want to go by and pick up a rose. Um, Thank you, Rick. I'm sorry that you didn't get the message in time, but uh, hopefully those roses will be put to good use. And with that, I do want to wish you all a very happy Valentine Day. Uh, today is, uh, is a, uh, a day that we're going to speak about even more in our message. So I hope that you will, uh, you'll, you'll keep with us while we do the, uh, the service this morning. Um, Obviously, we will not have music this morning. Uh, I will start with a prayer here, and then we'll go straight into our scriptures. Would you join me in prayer? Almighty and gracious God, this morning we come to you in a different format for us, but in the same message from you. Father, we ask that you be with us this morning, that those that are on the road be kept safe, we know that conditions are icy and dangerous and that they're only going to get worse over the next couple of days, so we just ask that you protect those people that have ventured out. Be with us as we go forward in this service. Be with those that are struggling with, with our pandemic. Be with those that are impacted both physically and emotionally. We know that COVID stress has has reached most of us, and we just ask that you help us as we hopefully come toward the end of this isolation period and the, the issues that we're all facing. Be with all of those that are suffering. Be with those that we lift up in our hearts by name in silence now. Father God, you've heard our prayers You've heard our pleas. You've heard our thanks. And now we ask that you make your presence known as we worship virtually and as we go forward with this service this morning. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to start this morning with our scripture lessons. Our first scripture comes from the Old Testament, uh, from the book of Psalm. <coughs> 
and I'll be reading from chapter 136, verses 1 through 9 and 23 through 26. <clears throat> oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who spread out the earth on all the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who made the great lights, for his steadfast love endures forever. In the sun to rule over the day, for his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and the stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. It is he who remembered us in our low state, for his steadfast love endures forever, and rescued us from our foes, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who gives food to all flesh, for his steadfast love endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endures forever. Our second reading comes from 1 John. It's an epistle reading. 1 John 5, verses 1 through 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus has been born of God and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that, the, that we love the children of God, for when we love God and obey his commands. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commands, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God conquers the world, and this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And our final reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 25 through 33. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to the span of your life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like, clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? you of little faith. Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. So, Originally, I was going to ask this and look for answers, but how do you define love? What does love mean to you? You know, today's uh, message is entitled, For the Love of God. And then we have Happy Valentine's Day. Now, how do these two phrases relate to each other? And I think that first we need to look at what Valentine's Day really is. Did you know that there are some Christians that think that Valentine's Day is satanic. They think that because they think that it was once associated with a pagan festival of Lupercalia. And it was a, a fertility festival that honored Thanus, the Roman god of agriculture. So it was a, a, a originally what they felt was a worship of, of a pagan god that, uh, that was responsible for the growth and the the agriculture and fertility. Now, most scholars have dismissed that theory, but there are still some Christians, and we all know some, that are living in the 19th century and refuse to change their beliefs. The most widely accepted legend, according to, uh, to Valentine, 
is that uh, St. Valentine that was a priest that ruled under the Emperor Claudius in the third century. One of the things that happened in that period of time is that young couples were forbidden to marry. Uh, it was against the law because the, the young men were needed for soldiers, needed as soldiers, and they thought that if they got married that these young men might be more concerned about the welfare of their wives than they were of fighting a battle. What would happen if they were killed? What would happen to their spouses? Now, Valentine, being a priest, secretly uh, performed marriages for these young couples. Uh, and that was, that was completely against the edict that Emperor Claudius had given. So Valentine was arrested, but you see, Claudius liked him. That is until Valentine tried to convert him to Christianity. Now, prior to all of this, Valentine had converted and befriended a judge named Asterius. Now, I'm getting into a lot of, of history here, but it's important. Asterius had a daughter that was blind, and he had asked uh, Valentine, being a priest, to, uh, to heal his daughter of the blindness. And he did, and in that process, Valentine and Asterius' daughter fell in love. And as a result of all of this, Asterius and all of his household, all of his servants, all of his family, were baptized in the Christian faith. And let's go back to where we were talking about uh, Claudius having Valentine arrested and then turning against him once he tried to convert him to Christianity. Claudius agreed that if, if uh, Valentine would only renounce his faith, that he would let him go. But Valentine refused. His faith was so strong and his trust and belief in the love of God was so strong that he refused. And he was sentenced to a threefold execution. First, he was to be beaten. Then he was to be stoned. And finally, he was to be beheaded. Kind of a rough sentence, don't you think? But before his execution, he wrote a note to Asterius' daughter and signed it, From your Valentine. That's how we get the legend of Valentine and the love. The love that Valentine had for, for Asterius' daughter to even remember her and to, to carry that love um, as he went to his execution. And then, of course, the note that he wrote, From your Valentine. Probably several of us have already given cards this morning that say from your Valentine. But now let's look at the other part of our sermon. Let's look at the what we've titled it, For the Love of God. Now, a lot of times that simple phrase, for the love of God, is used by people that are emphasizing shock or frustration or anger. And why? Why do they use that? Let's look at the true meaning of for the love of God. And I was going to ask you this morning, how do you define the love of God? What would you do for the love of God? Now let's look at the scriptures that I read just a minute ago. Let's look at Psalms 136 first. The common phrase throughout every one of those verses, verses 1 through 9, 23 through 26, and all of those in between, his steadfast love endures forever. I think that they were trying to make a point that God's love, no matter what, no matter how much the Hebrew people had, had uh, gone against the commandments, no matter how much they had done to worship idols, no matter how much they had done to go the other way, his steadfast love endures forever. That's one thing that we can depend on unlike that, that uh, love that we celebrate on Valentine's Day. Now, don't get me wrong. I feel that, that uh, the love that is expressed on Valentine's Day is very deep and very honest, but I also know that sometimes because we're human beings, it doesn't last. But God's love endures forever. 
This was the steadfast love of the creator of the heavens and the creator of the earth and the seas and the creator of the great lights, the, the sun in the, in the day and the moon at the night and then even the lesser lights of the stars at night. This, this is the God of all creation that is promising that his steadfast love will endure forever. He has an enduring love, that steadfast love, and it's for you and for me and for all of humanity. This verse was written about, about the God who uh, led the Hebrew people out of Egypt and delivered the Ten Commandments to Moses and forgave the Israelites for all of those times that they, they had forsaken him. And then he led them through the wilderness into the Promised Land. This is that God. And I want you to, to notice that, that even in the beginning, of the verses from Psalms, it says, this is the God above all gods whose steadfast love endures forever. Because a lot of these people were still worshiping lesser gods. And what it was trying to say is, this is the God, the God of creation. This is the God of the Old Testament. And so often we, we, we label the God of the Old Testament as a vengeful and a wrath-filled God. But that's not the case. That's not the case. God's wrath only became obvious because of disobedience and because of the lack of the love being returned. Now let's jump ahead to, uh, to 1 John chapter 5, the epistle that we read. In this epistle, in, this, in these verses, uh, they're comparing God to the parent, the parent of Jesus Christ. And the way the scripture reads is, as we love Christ as he loved us, that love is manifested and it, it uh, extends and encompasses the love of God. And even when our love fails, his love remains steadfast. And in verse 3 of chapter 5, it says, For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. Doesn't that sound pretty simple? Doesn't that sound pretty easy for us to understand? For the love of God means according to the scripture. For the love of God means that his steadfast love does endure forever. Now, Matthew 6, that we read from the Gospel of Matthew, is a pretty familiar passage. Uh, most of us have heard that sometimes. <laughs> and it is saying that, that God, by his nature, by the very fact that he is the God of creation, protects and nourishes the birds of the air. He tends to the lilies of the field, and he makes them grow, and he nourishes them, and he gives them what they need. And he clothes the grass of the field, which, which may be, even tomorrow, gone. Think about it. Think about the grass in your yard, that it's bright and green, but tomorrow it may be gone. It may have dried up. But God still cares enough to take care of it and to give it what it needs from the earth to grow and to flourish. And he loves our creation, his creation, that much that he's going to take care of it. He cares enough. He loves enough. His steadfast love endures, not just for us, but for all of his creation. That includes all of his people. If God is willing to take such good care of all of his creation, don't you think that he loves you and me enough to take care of us as of a child? You know, there, there are situations where parents um, may not treat their children right. They may not show them that love. They may not, may not uh, have that parental instinct. But that's not God. When we compare God to a parent, we compare God to a loving parent, one that nourishes, one that makes sure that we will flourish, one that cares and loves us enough to give his only son so that we can have eternal life. 
And I guess now the question is, for the love of God, what does He expect from us? What are we supposed to give back? Love. That's all. Love and devotion. It's the same thing that, that we find ourselves giving and expecting to receive from the people that we love. We know it's not always easy to love someone, but we still do. And if we look at the God's love for us, I'm sure that he says, what have I done? Sometimes it's not easy to love my creation, but his steadfast love endures forever. You know, if we go back and we look at, uh, at God's greatest commandment, when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He says, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind and your soul. That's all. And the second is as great that you love your neighbor as yourself. Are we doing that? When we look around society today, are we loving our neighbors as ourselves? Are we loving our neighbors with that same steadfast, enduring love that God gives us? That's all we're supposed to do. And our love toward other people, our love toward, toward humanity is expressing our love to God. That's all. Love. It's that simple. But how do we do it? Well, for those of us that have gotten married, we, we make a vow. We stand in front of, of a minister or a judge or a justice of the peace, and we have witnesses, and we have our best man and our bridesmaids and a maid of honor and, and all of our friends and family, and we make vows in front of God that we will love, honor, and cherish that person that we're making this commitment to. Normally today, we would have celebrated Holy Communion. And that's a way that we can, that we can show our love for God. When we celebrate Holy Communion, we acknowledge God's love for us. It's not what we do for God. It's what God does in us. It's a love that He has that is so deep that He did give His only Son for us. It's a love that is so deep that He promises, just like in Matthew 6, that He's going to take care of us. It's a love that goes beyond our temporary uh, small period of time that we spend on this earth in human existence, our spirits having a, a human experience. And all we have to do is to return that love, honestly, that we confess that love publicly, that we accept it not only for ourselves, but as we allow that to build in us, that it overflows from us and it goes into the community, it goes to other people, and we can show God's love. His steadfast love endures forever. We affirm our vows when we do communion. We affirm our vows that we love God and that we are doing our best to live by His commandments like the Scriptures tell us to. You know, I hope on this Valentine's Day that you not only have time to spend with your loved ones and that special person in your life, but I hope that you'll take time to spend just a few minutes with God. Because even though some of those human loves may fail, some of those human loves may may uh, waver, God's steadfast love endures forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Next week, I hope that we'll be able to gather. I hope that we'll be able to celebrate communion. We will also be consecrating the bags that we, have, we are putting together for Kids for Kids. We've received all the bags. We have many of the supplies, and we, we hope to begin distribution of those here in the next week or two. I know uh, Lori, in our, Lori and Ginger in Nunley are, are working to put some of those together, so we'll have them ready. Uh, and I hope you'll join us as we consecrate those, as we hopefully celebrate Holy Communion, and as we get, begin the season of Lent, don't forget that we will have our Lent service on Wednesday evening, weather permitting. We'll put a note out on that. And I hope that you will join us. I hope that you will allow God to work in you. 
Remember that what we do is not something we do for God, but it is something that we are asking Him to do through us, to take charge of our lives. Would you pray with me? Almighty and gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for the love, the steadfast love that endures forever that you give us. And we ask that you help us as we try to allow that love to grow in us and to to become part of us so that it overflows and we can share that and, and take it into our community and into our neighborhoods and into our families. Father, we ask that you be with those that are traveling we know that this is a dangerous situation and it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. And we just ask that you allow us to have some common sense to stay in when we can and to just spend time, just spend time not worrying, not rushing, not, not thinking about what we need to do, but thinking about what we can do. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. I hope that you are safe, I hope that you are warm, and I hope to see you again soon. Have a great week, and God bless.